when we look at this war in Ukraine, what was the end game for the U.S. foreign policy in Ukraine? Well, it wasn't really an end game so much as a fantasy. Uh, the United States actually believed that uh, it would uh, enable uh, Ukraine to drain Russia's resources. Uh, that was the main thing. It, it had no uh, intention or expectation that Ukraine could actually beat Russia. What it thought was, was that if uh, uh, they could get a uh, puppet leader like Zelensky to fight to the last Ukrainian, uh, every Ukrainian that died would at least absorb one Russian bullet. And that would help deplete Russia's military capacity. Uh, obviously, Russia has a lot more bullets than Ukrainians had uh, individuals, and uh, the Americans had no understanding of how large uh, Russia's manufacturing uh, company was. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, State Department and military strategists believed the Kool-Aid that they'd been drinking. Uh, they believed the fantasy that Russia was just a gas station with atom bombs, uh, and that all Russia could do was either drop an atom bomb or else uh, let uh, the Ukrainians march right into Moscow, and all the people would get so upset that uh, Russia had lost that they'd overthrow Putin and bring back an American back Boris Yeltsin, and America could then uh, repurchase uh, Russian resources and restore neoliberalism. Uh, that was a fantasy, not an endgame. Uh, there was no real analysis, uh, and there were some analysts, as uh, uh, Ray McGovern uh, has explained so often, that did understand what was happening, and they were fired by being told, well, you're just not the corporate type. Uh, you you uh, uh, must have some reason to, to want Russia to win if you don't think that uh, we can beat it. Uh, why are you uh, pro-Russian? Uh, we're going to put in pro-Americans. And so all they got was uh, flag waivers. Uh, and the uh, army generals, whose uh, main hope for advancement uh, wasn't to get another star on the uniform. It was to go on the board of directors of Raytheon and uh, the military industrial complex and have uh, make real money uh, by being uh, on, on the board. So uh, the whole way in which uh, the dynamics were centered uh, were uh, not having much to do with the real military situation at all. Why did the U.S. sanctions not bring the Russian economy to its needs? That really wasn't the purpose of the sanctions. Uh, the the uh, war in Ukraine wasn't a war against Russia. It was a war against NATO. It was the United States uh, had a nightmare, and that was that uh, Germany, other European countries, were going to see uh, their road to prosperity to lie with increasing trade and investment uh, with Russia. Uh, the Germans had an ideal that uh, they're going to export their automobiles, their industry, their washing machines and consumer goods to Russia uh, at uh, high value added industrial prices. And in exchange, they, uh, they, uh, Russia would get the money to buy these uh, German uh, exports by selling oil and gas at a very low price to Germany. And it was a circular flow of raw materials and uh, uh, industrial goods. And uh, that would make Europe increasingly prosperous, but its prosperity would be shared with Russia and Eurasia. Uh, along with uh, with China and and uh, leave the United States behind. And so uh, the sanctions uh, against Russia were America's attempt to say, we're going to make an iron curtain. Uh, and this iron curtain is to prevent you from making money with uh, with uh, Russia. If you're going to trade, it has to be with us. Uh, so instead of buying Russian natural gas and oil, you will pay uh be dependent on American liquefied natural gas at three times the price. You will have to spend five billion dollars making port uh, uh, ports large enough to uh, accept the container ships with the liquefied natural gas. We will have the power to turn off your gas 
uh, at any point in case you ever wanted to vote socialist, uh, uh, we can get complete control over you. Uh, this was um, uh, the sanctions against Russia were, were to uh, draw a rope around Europe to tie it into dependency on the United States economy. Uh, that was the, the aim. And uh, the effect, of course, was indeed to bring uh, uh, the German industrialization uh, to an end. Uh, because uh, without Russian gas and uh, dependent on um, uh, American gas, uh, Russian industry was simply uh, not uh, competitive with other industries. So uh, it, it had lost. And uh, the Eurozone was uh, brought to its knees because if you look at the balance of payments of Europe, uh, the balance of payments was largely supported by German exports uh, in, and industrial exports. And one of the reasons that Germany was so interested in joining the Eurozone was uh, without being having your currency tied to the French, Italian, Dutch, and uh, other economies, the uh, German uh, mark would have gone up uh, just as the Swiss franc has gone up, and uh, uh, that would have priced uh, German exports out of the market. But uh, by being tied to the rest of Europe, you had uh, uh, Southern Europe running a balance of payments deficit that was keeping the euro's exchange rate low enough so that German Germany was not priced out of the market as it ran a big trade and uh, uh, investment sur surplus. So uh, the effect was all of a sudden denying Germany from the source of energy, and energy is really the source of uh, labor productivity, well, that prevented uh, Germany from uh, uh, from running a surplus, and that uh, means that the European uh, balance of payments uh, was drained uh, in the process. And now you're going to have a weakening uh, uh, European uh, euro, and uh, more and more of a problem is going to be coming up. Well, the effect on your, your question really was what's the effect on Russia? Sanctions against any country are have uh, almost always backfire because the effect of sanctions is very much like creating protective tariffs for the country. When America told uh, uh, the Baltics, stop exporting your cheese and your uh, food, uh, your grain crops uh, to Russia, uh, what did Russia do? Uh, without cheese, it didn't starve to death. It said, okay, we're going to start our own cheese industry. Now it no longer de depends on Lithuania and the Baltics for cheese. Uh, and it no longer, and uh, the same thing uh, with uh, the common agricultural policy for Europe was always one of the key benefits. And uh, Europe had hoped uh, to be a grain exporter. Well, uh, once there are sanctions on Russia, Russia develops its own agriculture and its own grain. So the effect of sanctions was to make Russia independent of, of, uh, uh, of uh, the Eurozone and uh, increasingly self-reliant. And uh, that has certainly strengthened its balance of payments, not losing it. So Russia has lost the export income from its oil and gas to Europe, but it's, it's uh, uh, no longer has to pay the import charges of its uh, food and uh, the other products that it was getting before the sanctions because it's producing these uh, at home. So uh, basically, it's as if President Biden said, uh, President Putin, we love you. We want to help you. Uh, we're going to help you get rich in Russia the same way we got rich in the United States. We're going to uh, help you do uh, protective tariffs. Now, uh, your neoliberal uh, people in Russia don't tell you that, but uh, you do need protective tariffs. And since you won't enact these yourselves, you'll, uh, like we did in the 19th century, we'll have sanctions and that will help you develop your own industry. And so you can end up getting rich just the way the United States did. And um, uh, you, you'll be happier and uh, uh, much better. And uh, uh, the result is uh, exactly what you've seen. Uh, Russia is now much more independent and strong, and there's uh, no uh, uh, power that uh, uh, America or Europe have to impose any further sanctions on Russia. 
when you look at Europe right now, they're following everything U.S. says in Ukraine. Why the Europeans so much under the thumb of the U.S. foreign policy? Uh, the United States has uh, politically interfered in European affairs ever since uh, 1945. Uh, I think I, a decade or two ago, I visited uh, Berlin, for instance, uh, and uh, I was taken to, there's a big hill that uh, in Berlin, where uh, when they were uh, cleaning up the bombed out city in 1945, they took all of the uh, uh, refuse, the, the bricks and the uh, building materials that they'd uh, uh, cleaned out of the bombed out uh, buildings and they made a big hill. And on the top of the big hill, there were uh, US communications spy satellites spy offices. And uh, uh, you remember uh, maybe a decade ago, uh, turned out the Americans were listening to Angela Merkel's phone calls. Uh, the Americans uh, were uh, tapping the phones of every leading American poli of uh, European politician. And also the, uh, the Americans had scouts, the National Endowment for Democracy, meaning an endowment for neoliberal uh, 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 not, uh, oligarchy, uh, were looking for people like uh, uh, Miss von der Leyen or Angelina uh, uh, Baerbeck. Uh, and uh, they were looking for people who had the promise of being opportunistic, very clever, uh, and the right to uh, essentially uh, throw their career in line with helping the United States. So the United States set up throughout Europe many non-governmental organizations. And these organizations uh, were uh, basically talent scouts. Uh, they were looking for promising, entrepreneurial, ambitious, uh, opportunistic uh, business people and politicians. And uh, they would uh, find the people who were most willing to buy the uh, US uh, political Kool-Aid and uh, uh, follow the US. And uh, uh, it, uh, they were pretty much dominating European politics, uh, also through the control of the European media. And so the, Euro the uh, uh, European Union leaders do not represent the European business interests or the economy or the European people. They represent the, uh, basically, uh, I won't say their employers, but uh, the, peop the, uh, the US uh, foundations and government that have uh, been uh, uh, promoting their careers uh, all these decades. And I've been told by uh, US Treasury officials that uh, the US can always get what it wants from Europe, because the fact is the Europeans are probably the most corrupt uh, politicians in the world. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, India, Pakistan, Europe outdoes you, according to the US. Yeah, they're they sell out cheaper. And the U.S. says all we need is envelopes with hundred dollar bills and we have the policy. So uh, the policy, the European policy is really uh, done, designed in the United States and put in the hands of uh, the European uh, proconsuls. Uh, the euro uh, was designed uh, as a satellite currency for the, uh, uh, for the US dollar uh, by, by Robert Mundell at the University of Chicago. Uh, and it was designed as basically an anti-labor uh, uh, policy, an anti-industrial policy. Uh, and so the uh, England uh, and continental Europe have both followed uh, the neoliberal uh, finance capitalist uh, model that uh, doesn't really help Europe, uh, but it, it locks Europe into a satellite status uh, with the United States. We know that the conflict, the war in Ukraine has hit Europe so hard. If you were an advisor to the European Union, what would you say to them as a key to get out of this problems that they are dealing with right now? I'd say, of course, there is a there is an escape. Uh, I think you Germans should all move to Russia and China. Leave Europe. There is, Europe is uh, uh, what uh, Donald Rumsfeld, the U.S., uh, the head of the uh, mil military, called old Europe is a dead zone. The Eurozone is dead. It cannot be uh, revived without a radical restructuring, and it's not going to restructure. Uh, it is on a suicidal 
trajectory. Uh, uh, all you can do is get out of the sinking ship. There is no way that uh, uh, anything that I would tell them to, uh, to try to look at why China is growing and you're not. Look at uh, what you would uh, look at what your uh, industrialists have said uh, of wanting to uh, get rich and employ German labor by exporting to Russia. You're not doing that. Uh, you, uh, there's no way you can break from the United States, given the corruption of your uh, politicians and the fact that you don't have an economic theory, an economic doctrine that is an alternative to neoliberalism. And without uh, uh, understanding classical economics, without understanding value and price theory and economic rent and the difference between earned and unearned income, uh, there's no way that you can uh, make an economic policy that actually works. Uh, so you don't have an economic theory, basically, except uh, uh, that uh, that is leading you into poverty. It seems that they are so much in love with Yeltsin as much as they hate Putin. What's the difference, in your opinion, between these two figures? That was the lost dream that uh, under Yeltsin, uh, Russia uh, backed every ruble that it issued domestically with uh, a U.S. dollar holding. In other words, for every ruble that uh, Russia uh, created for spending within its economy, it had to borrow uh, a U.S. dollar to hold in its reserves. And uh, at the beginning, I was told by uh, uh, investors, uh, Wall Street people, that they were charging Russia 100% interest per year to give Russia dollars. Now, the reality is that Russia didn't need dollars at all to create its domestic money. It could just print the money. And in fact, that's just what Russian Central Bank did. When it got the dollar, it printed the money anyway. The only difference is that it needlessly uh, borrowed U.S. dollars and uh, permitted the United States to come in and uh, convince the, uh, uh, the kleptocrats to register factories, oil reserves, electric utilities, everything in their own name, uh, and then to sell out. But they'd already wiped out the Russian savings through the shock therapy. So the only people that the kleptocrats could sell to after they uh, uh, registered the companies in their own name were American investors. And uh, they sold at uh, such low prices that between 1994 and 1996, Russia was the most profitable stock market in the entire world. And in fact, um, I was working uh, with Scudder Stevens, uh, one of the uh, brokerage houses, and uh, a former student of mine was their economist. And uh, she was told she was going to be fired because she didn't invest in, uh, in Ru this Russia takeover. And she said, well, she didn't invest in it because she saw it was all going to collapse in 1997 and that it was a complete fantasy. And uh, what she was told was, ah, but you should have invested from 1994 and seven in the fantasy and then jumped out before the whole crash came. That was the mentality. The Americans wanted uh, to be able to come in and uh, re uh, to transfer Russia's raw materials, industrial capacity, uh, uh, farmland, natural resources, and in their own name uh, and uh, remove it from Russia. It's a strategy that had worked uh, for third world global south countries uh, for the last 50 years. Uh, and they thought that they could do it in Russia. And uh, the problem is that uh, the Russians uh, uh, had uh, no background at all in, in Marxism. It's one of the few countries that had no Marxism at all. And without Marxism, they didn't even have classical economics. They didn't have Adam Smith or John Stuart Mill, or any uh, of the uh, economists that talked about economic rent. Uh, they didn't know what a free lunch was. Uh, they really didn't understand capitalism. Uh, they understood sort of the propaganda view that capitalism was about employers exploiting uh, wage earners, 
but they didn't understand that finance capitalism uh, was all about rent seeking and uh, natural resource rent and land rent. And uh, they didn't understand that what Russia could have done uh, uh, as opposed to Yeltsin was uh, what I had been advocating when I went back three times and lectured before the Duma and said, look, you have all your housing. You can give your housing to everybody who occupies it now. Give your uh, all of your real estate to its current occupants freely. You will have the lowest cost economy in the world by uh, just turning over the real estate to them. You will be an economy without land rent. And uh, in the West, America, England, 80% of bank credit, of the debt uh, uh, overhead is mortgage rent. Russia was free of all this. It could have got free of it, but the Americans convinced that uh, Russia that uh, the way to get rich was America's to emulate the neoliberalism that American students are taught in the school. What Russians didn't realize that Russia gets rich by tricking other countries into adopting neoliberalism and is getting rich off them, not off uh, off America. Uh, they just didn't understand how capitalism worked. The reason behind these endless wars we are witnessing in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Ukraine, now in Israel, ongoing conflict, on and on. Is that related to military industrial, as, as Ray McGovern calls it, Mickey Matt, military industrial, congressional, media, tick tank. Is that the reason for these endless wars, in your opinion? That's just exactly word for word what uh, President uh, Biden said the other day before Congress. He said, uh, yes, we can afford the, the war in Ukraine and Israel because the arms that they're using employ American labor. He said, if you want to be employed, if you want your living standards to go up, you have to make the arms to kill other people. We, you will get rich and be able to afford to pay rising rents and afford to pay your credit cards and afford to pay for your automobile loans by producing arms that we can tell other countries, uh, fight to the last Ukrainian, fight to the last Israeli as uh, uh, the war spreads, fight to the last uh, Taiwanese, if we can convince Taiwan to go to war with China. That's exactly what you don't need a Ray McGovern, who I have a great admiration for, I listen uh, uh, to say it uh, because he's considered to be a critic, just just look at what President Biden said. His argument is just exactly that. Uh, we're, we're, we're at war for the military because that's the all that we can produce now. Uh, we can't compete industrially. We can't compete uh, uh, in uh, technology. The one thing we can compete is uh, the ability to uh, make, we can sell arms uh, to have you people fight each other uh, uh, instead of joining together and making an alternative to the kind of world that we have planned for you. Mm -hmm.